This presentation and the Q&A is streaming live as a webinar and there's also a Twitter hashtag uh, for the event called hashtag Potter QLD, Potter Queensland. Feel free to post your observations as part of the discussion and also the, of the later sessions. We'll have a Q&A session at the end of this presentation. The presentation should run for about 40 minutes. Um, we have uh, the casting couch up here where a couple of the staff will be on the casting couch, thankfully not me. Um, I'll have a microphone with Nicole. We'll be out in the audience with a roving mic for you to answer questions. At the Q&A, if you could please remember when you want to ask a question, just to state your name and your organisation, that would be great. I have the very easy task, I think, of just introducing the Potter Foundation. Um, and this slide is interesting, and I'll actually read to you verbatim um, the, uh, the description that's been included here by one of my staff members. Um, the excerpt on this slide is from the first annual report. Um, it's a bit dry and a bit boring, but it, encapsula it encapsulates in spirit very much the ethos of the Foundation today, and in the process creating a lasting, enduring change to Australia's philanthropic landscape. Um, I don't think it is boring uh, myself. Um, if you read it, the Foundation is aimed to direct its financial assistance to areas not covered by assistance from other sources. Importantly, in my opinion, so it's emphasis added by me, it is a view of the Governors that rather than offer funds in substitution for governmental or institutional assistance, the Foundation should direct its interest to projects that do not immediately qualify for such assistance. And that is a very important distinction and something that the Governors are very focused on. We often get asked the question, where is the Government in this, um, whatever project is we might be reviewing. On the other hand, the Foundation has also been prepared to provide funds solely or in cooperation with other benefactors as a flux to induce official assistance for worthwhile projects. In today's speak, that's basically referred to as leverage. Um, and that was produced in 1965. What I think is impressive is that those statements really do endure today and are relevant today as well. Um, as I said, I've been CEO of the Foundation since December of 2015. My background is in financial services and, and the corporate sector. Um, and I've been incredibly impressed by the quality of the team uh, that I inherited at the Foundation. Um, I think one of my roles as CEO is to empower the team. Um, and I hope today that you are as impressed by the quality of the team as I have been since I've been CEO. So without any further ado, the first team member to present you today is uh, Dr. Alberto Falan, uh, my Senior Program Manager. I hope you enjoy the day. Thank you, Craig, and oh, the theatre, don't you love that? So there we go, the funding merry-go-round. So let's be honest, how many of you do feel like that every now and then? Lands, ends, is it? Come on, be honest, come on. Come on. So I actually, I myself feel like that sometimes, and uh, you know, we're in the middle of funding round at the moment, we just closed one, and we're starting all over again in three months' time. And, but um, especially at um, 4.30 in the morning as I drive to the airport this morning, I ask myself why? Uh, why, why are we here and, uh, and what is the meaning of all of this? And uh, um, I think I can come up with a simple conclusion that uh, you will all remember certainly as of today. So um, the reason we're here is not for you to get a grant. Um, the reason we're here is for you to deliver at the best of your capacity your projects for your communities. And we might or might not be a part of that as funders. So again, the reason we're here is to enable you to work with your communities through our funding. And that's our mission, and we operate through you. Without you, we don't have any meaning for existence. Um, so what's the situation? The situation after that is that uh, essentially you, as every other not-for-profit on this planet, is uh, um, uh, limited, has limited resources. You have limited resources in time, people, money, connections, networks, and all of that. And in order for you to be as efficient as possible to deliver on your mission, you need to, uh, to understand the uh, funding landscape. And that's what we're here for. You need to understand what uh, foundations are like, and every foundation is different. Uh, and in order to do that, you need to do the, your research. So website, conferences, um, consultants, workshops, uh, presentation like today, you need to understand who is there, your audience, when you present the amazing work you do. But more than anything else, uh, you need to understand yourselves. Now, sorry, I'm going to get a little philosophical on you. Uh, again, 4.30 in the morning brings about that. Um, I think that in order to understand 
the fundraising, the, sorry, the, the philanthropic landscape and how it works, you really need to communicate who you are so that we can understand it. Uh, and, and we can match our guidelines with your guidelines and priority as well. So um, unless you communicate that, uh, it's really hard for us to, to get that. Um, so you need to um, find the right funder. And we have a uh, slide from my, uh, an app I shall not mention because I can't do that. Um, so some numbers are a little bit scary, uh, but uh, that's the reality. So uh, in uh, health and disability, the last round we had 147 expressions of interest. And that boils down to 22 full application and 11 grants. So there is a less than 10% success rate from EOI to grant, but there is uh, about a 50% success rate from full application to grants. Um, what you want to do, in our opinion, is in order to maximize your chances uh, as success, you need to target your application. But don't, don't change your application to fit our guidelines. Just tell us what, who you are and what you want to do. It might fit with us, it might not. But today, we're going to find out if it does. So I'll introduce uh, Louise, who will speak about what we fund and why. Thanks, Alberto. Oh, skipping ahead. Okay, so how do you work out whether or not you fit with us? How well do you align? First of all, I just want to take you through our foundation's funding principles, and you'll find these on our website, and it's a good place to start. So these principles underpin all our giving across all our program areas. And what do they mean? Well, we aim to support organisations and individuals and programs that are really outstanding in their field, the cream of the crop, if you like. And this can be demonstrated by you by transformative and game-changing projects that are really going to make a difference beyond just your organisations, ultimately. Programs and projects that lift the bar right across the sector that are game-changing. That's what we're looking for. They have to be really strategic, and that's a tricky word, what does that mean? But that they, al they align carefully with your own mission and with your own internal strategies, and that they've got really strong buy-in from all your staff and from your board in particular, so there's great commitment from your organisation to deliver, and beyond just the life of the, the grant that we make, and projects that are really well planned and properly budgeted. In, we focus on prevention, so we prefer to have um, the fence at the top of the cliff rather than the ambulance at the bottom. And this means that projects that we support are very outcomes focused, with well articulated long term goals and short term KPIs, key performance indicators. We look very closely at those, as Squirrel will tell you more about in a little while. We place great emphasis on innovation projects which drive change and explore new practices or approaches, and we support pilots and often um, replication or expansion of successful pilots in other locations or contexts as well. I do want to make a quick note there. We don't only support innovation because we recognise that we can't always be creating new things and sometimes there are things that you do that you've discovered that are working really, really well and as I say, you need support to expand or further outreach. So don't feel that it's, you have to keep changing all the time but we do love innovation where we find it. Sustainability. We can't support projects in perpetuity, as I'm sure you'll all understand, but we do expect our grantees to build in mechanisms to sustain the project beyond the life of the grant. So we're looking to fund multi-year sustainable projects, not nice-to-do one-offs that would cease when the money runs out. Sustainable doesn't mean you have to have all your funds in place before you start but it means you have to have good plans, a strong chance of raising the funds, and that your organisation is fully committed to it. So this means that we're happy and uh, always look to be just a, one of a number of supporters of, of your programs, because we like to consider that our grants have much greater impact where they're combined with support that you can leverage from other organisations. You 
need to explain to us why you are the right organisation to do this. Because we look at your, your applications and ask that question. Are these the right people to deliver this program? And are they working with, speaking to, the, the other people who, who should be consulted or involved in some way? So collaboration is really important. It can reduce duplication, increase the sharing of the lessons learned, and take up of successful tools and methods. So that ultimately will increase impact. So you need to be looking outwards from your organisation, and you've got strong communication and dissemination strategies in place, and focus on evaluation and learning, because data and evidence are important to us. OK, so moving on from our principles, Here's our program areas, and how well do you align with these? I'm assuming you can all read those. So here is what we fund. Each program area has its own objectives and guidelines, and we're going to go through these in the breakout sessions after the main session today um, in, with individual program areas. We've gone through a very rigorous process in the last couple of years, looking at all the grants we've made over the past five to ten years, Squirrel Maine has been doing this, to see how effective our giving has been. And this data has helped us to narrow our guidelines in each of our focus areas and be much more targeted about what we believe we can achieve and we can support you to do. So we're very focused in our areas and committed to our guidelines and objectives. So that means that if you come to us with a request for funding towards purchasing land under environment and conservation or supporting education programs in primary schools, you'll be unfortunately wasting your time and wasting ours as well because they're not going to fly. We have to be brutally honest and so we will tell people if they call us and talk to us about what they're doing or submit an, an EOI that just doesn't match these areas, doesn't align, will be saying, I'm sorry, that's highly unlikely to be prioritised. So if you hear those words, you'll know it means it's not going to fly. So your homework after today, after the sessions today, will be to do your research. Look at our website, read our newsletters, annual reports and any other communications you can get from us to see how well your organisation, your projects, your mission aligns with what we do. Um, we do encourage people to call us and talk to the relevant program manager and make sure you've, you've prepared before you make that call because you need to be able to talk clearly and knowledgeably about what you plan to do, about the demand for it, the costs, the budget, sources of income, project management, sustainability, etc. Do listen to the advice we give you because we're in regular contact with our board and so we need to try and understand what they are likely to want to support. They're the decision makers, the ultimate decision makers. And Nicole's going to talk a bit more about that. Um, so in following these steps as we talk you through today, you'll be laying the groundwork for developing strong relationships with us. And of course, that's at the heart of philanthropy. It's about relationships and communication. Partnerships are the key to successful grant making, and I'm sure for you they're the key to successful um, finding successful supporters. So applying for grants is an ongoing journey, like the Yellow Brick Road. So we encourage you to aim high, follow your path, and try to bring collaborators, partners, and potential supporters and funders along with you. And we hope that that will be us. So we'll move on to Squirrel, who's going to give you some guidance about how to write competitive applications. Thank you, Louise. So Louise has given a great overview of the big picture. But let's face it, most of you all in here Let's say you may have trained as ballet dancers, you may have trained as environmental scientists, you may have trained as a so social worker. You probably didn't necessarily do a full university course in how to write grants, how to acquit grants, and then let's say on Wednesday you might be needing to do a budget, so, so how to do bookkeeping and accounting, and then on Thursday an evaluation report. So many hats that you're needing to wear. So what we're hoping to do today is to give you some tips that might help that grant writing and application hat. So what are we looking for? 
Has this been done before? A great example. We had a grantee write to us and they wanted to do a report and a project on macadamia nuts, sending owls out and having them building roosts to get more owls in. As it turns out, they built 18 roosts, no owls came, the macadamia farms were still plagued by rodents. So this was a bit disappointing, but sometimes in philanthropy we take risks. We're not necessarily like government that needs to necessarily to adhere to a specific program, we can go out there on a limb. But in this case, in the final acquittal report, they wrote, oh, this project was actually done in Arizona previously and had no successful results. So in my mind, that was a little bit of our bad for not doing our prior research, but we can also ask that we're getting onto that. We ask that you do the same. Has this been done before? Who's been successful at it? Think about it, talk about it. Who, with whom can you collaborate? Next up, who's on deck? So get those key stakeholders involved early. We really love to see projects with multiple partnerships, sector-wide game changers. Those are, they're getting big ticks in our mind. Also your own staff or yourself. Is there one person that is a key knowledge holder? Somebody that without whom the whole entire project would fall down. And think about how you're thinking of the redundancy for that person. So for example, if they won the lottery tomorrow, I'm not saying they wouldn't continue working on the project, but if they hypothetically move to Bali, do you have redundancy in the system? And I'll be talking about that a little bit more in the evaluation workshop and can give you some stories on that. Devil being in the details. We funded projects, and I read all the final acquittal reports, so I probably read about 100 a year, and we've recently reviewed over 1,000 and back-entered them into the database over the last five years. Thank you for those who gave me information on that. And we found, for example, some projects, they bought the machine, expensive piece of machinery, and they didn't have space on the bench to put it and plug it in. So it's purchased, and it's in a box just next to the bench. That's not okay. Um, so making sure those details, or ethics, a lot of projects get pushed back by six months. They, they get a university collaborator on board and they miss one ethics committee. So know when those ethics deadlines might apply and factor them into your timeline. We don't actually care. We, we like multi-year projects, so multi-year is a good thing, but to take the time to plan out when those projects will be. And in terms of budget, a lot of times people think, ooh, if I just make this look cheap, then the foundation might fund me. Let me cut a little here and cut a little there. That's actually not what we're looking for. We're looking for an intelligently resourced project. We're looking for an adequate budget to get the job done. Now that's not, you know, go throw everything in, but an adequate budget. So you may not need a pot this big to boil an egg, but you still do need something in which to boil your eggs. So, a caution, a word of advice. We had one grantee got so excited they had a pot of grant for a conference. They normally spend about 10,000 and they run a weekend long conference. They got the pot of grant and they said, ooh, we'll book a bigger venue and we'll make it a five day conference. And they did all these amazing things to beef it up. They were so excited. And they ended up having fewer people attend, almost predictably, because most people said, oh, I could only make it for the weekend. Five days was a bit much. Or, oh, ticket prices were a bit higher because they were the hotel and accommodation near the newer venue was a bit more dear. That was a problem. And they ended up losing $10,000. So that's one of the few cases I can think of where our grants caused harm. So I'm on a mission now to, to warn people you know, figure out the size of the pot that you need to boil your eggs, and that, that's what you ask for. Not too small, not too big. Smart, how many folks have heard of SMART goals? Oh, heaps of you, look at that. So your evaluator hat on Thursday is looking very shiny, fantastic. But for those that haven't, this was about a third of the audience, SMART, the specific, measurable, and then people start to argue about the A and the R, but let's go with achievable, rewarding, and time-bound. We do look for that type of goal writing in our application. Now, we're talking about the short-term outputs. If you have a 24-month grant period, um, and so in 24 months, I'll be reading your acquittal report, make those goals about what's going to happen during those 24 months. We have a separate section on long-term outcomes, you know, tell us, be specific, the number of workshops that you're going to hold. Uh, if you're employing somebody, tell us that you're employing, you know, X person to do Y, Z jobs. 
Yeah, so very specific about that. And what I've done is I've stolen a few, I'm so sorry if you're in the audience, <laughs> some good examples and then some maybe less than good examples, and I'll just read one or two out to get the flavor of it. So specific, concise, simple language, really good. By 30th June 2017, success will be defined as having captured data on all childhood cancers. Diagnosed in Australia between 80, 1983 and 2013, approximately 19,000 eligible cases. Notice they didn't go to the trouble to say 19,153 eligible cases. It's approximate, but we get the idea. They're building a database on childhood cancers, including complete treatment data from all major pediatric treating hospitals for the period with follow-up on mortality status at the end of 2014. And I, I put that in to just remember it's real people and real children and real lives that we're dealing with, and I really admire and respect all of the work that you all are doing in medical research, in community well-being, across the sectors to improve lives. So that's specific, but which ones are not as specific? I'll read you two, and it'll be a teaser to the evaluation workshop. So you don't want to be too vague. Here's one. Sorry if it's yours. Each milestone will have the expected outcomes outlined so as to confirm with the objectives that have completed and was successful. Possible technical difficulties that may be encountered in the process will also be noted. This will allow time to troubleshoot and look at alternative methods early on in the, I still don't know what they're going to do. Um, another key tip would be don't use too much jargon. So if you are doing a medical research grant and you pop in IDA been known, known, OPA1, DOA, we have incredibly educated boards. Some of them have been high court judges, vice chancellors, senior managers at banks, but they're not necessarily experts in your field where you're an expert. So just make sure that jargon is accessible to an educated, but not necessarily expert in your field audience. Um, lastly, don't think you can save the world in the 24-month grant. So the success of this project will be determined by the number of papers published in well-recognized journals globally, the filing of patents, awards received for recognitions of scientific excellence, international conferences attended, and elections to the Australian Academy of Sciences and other learned societies. That was their goal, their short-term goal. Um, I'm interested for their long-term goal, but realistically, they didn't get a grant because it wasn't a realistic description of what they're actually going to be doing um, during that. So the evaluation breakout session will be, for those interested in exploring things like these KPIs, um, held afterwards, and we'll be doing a repeat, so if you can't make the first one, go for the second one. Now, Nicole is going on, and she is going to be discussing what is happening once the applications are submitted. So what happens once your application is submitted? Well, you'll be pleased to know that it's not left in the hands of the gods. Once you send it in, it is carefully processed, reviewed and assessed before a decision make, is made and the whole review process takes approximately four months. The first step is that it goes through an eligibility check with our admin team. It is then reviewed by a program manager. Following that, it is reviewed by a committee, a subcommittee of the board of governors and then it goes to a full board of 14 governors which, as Squirrel mentioned, is made up of very highly esteemed independent directors. The process is far from arbitrary. In reviewing applications, all projects have potential and strengths, but unfortunately, we simply do not have the funds to support every application we invite. The success rate of EOIs varies across program areas, but approximately one in four EOIs is invited to full application, and of those invited, approximately 40% are successful. So as Alberta mentioned earlier, it's less than one in 10 from EOI through to full grant. If you are successful, congratulations. Um, you're, you're in the minority. Um, please don't just take the money and run. Keep in touch with us. As Louise said earlier, it's about building a relationship. We've invested in your organisation and your project and we want to hear how you are going. We uh, see ourselves as your partner. Plan to check in with us rec regularly at least every once, once every six months. We'll formally check in, you, check in with you with progress reports and final reports. But in the interim, we want to know the good, the bad and the ugly as it's happening. If you're running behind schedule, let us know. We can um, adjust your reporting timelines to coincide with the delays in your project. If you're going to be featured in the news, let us know. We can share via our social networks. 
If you all of a sudden lose all of your government funding, let us know. We can share, we can, may not be able to help you ourselves, but we may be able to fill the, with filling the funding gap, but we may be able to put you in touch with other funders who can. Another funder in Adelaide told us a story where one of their long-time partners lost all their government funding and they didn't let them know and unfortunately that organisation had to close down and had they known they may be able to assist and fill that gap for them and so we would, you'd want to know if we lost our government funding so please let us know if you do. Honest communication is vital with your funder. Ultimately we want you to succeed. It makes us feel like we've backed a winner. So for us to help best support you, we need to be kept in the loop, warts and all. If you're not successful, which is the majority of um, people that submit an EOI, it's probably not the outcome that you were looking for, but that does not necessarily mean it's the end of the relationship. It could be the start of a longer conversation. Don't take it personally. As Alberta said, one in 10 EOIs make it through to a successful grant. There are simply more projects out there than we are able to fund, and the majority are not successful. We're also not the only funder in Australia, so you may be able to adapt the project to apply to another funder, and hopefully the process you've gone through with us may contribute to your future success. And if you're not successful, it does not mean that we don't want to ever hear from you again. The project you apply for may just not have been the right fit for us, or it might not have been the right time in the round that it was submitted. So importantly, don't give up. It may be a very difficult funding environment out there, and we know this, but keep persisting. A research institute in Perth applied to us seven times before they received their first grant, and they've now received over 10 grants from the foundation totaling over a million dollars. It all goes back to Alberto um, earlier said about Tind uh, Tinder, is it Tinder? Tinder. It's about finding the right match or the right connection and the right partner, um, and that's how we see our relationship with you. So I'll pass back to Alberta now. Okay. Yep. I actually don't think Alberto named the app, but anyway, that's, um, <laughs> I'll leave that alone. Look, thank you to all the presenters. Um, can I also just stop for 10 seconds and thank Maraid, who's moderating uh, the webinar. I heard some chuckles at the various slides that were up there. Um, they're all from various movies. Um, Maraid put the slide together. She is uh, an unabashed moody movie buff, loves the movies. Um, if anyone recognised all of the movies and you think you can write them down, share it with me afterwards because I have a prize for you um, and good luck. I just want to reiterate before we start the Q&A uh, with Alberto a couple of things. Um, we are genuine when we say that we want to have a dialogue with you and a conversation. Not every conversation you have necessarily ends with uh, the result you're looking for. Not every conversation is an easy conversation, even when you have an existing relationship or whether you are an existing uh, recipient of funds from us. But honesty is the best policy when dealing with us or with, when dealing with any foundation. Um, also, as well, think of us as a prospective partner if we are not an existing partner. Um, and understand that as a foundation that's been around for 54 years, um, we do genuinely think long term. We, we have the luxury of being able to think big picture, of being able to think long term. Um, and as we get to know you, we might start to understand where you fit in the context of what it is that you do and the community that you serve. And ultimately, there may be an opportunity for us to work together. That's very important to contextualise the, the type of relationships that we are looking for. Um, the example I'll give you was a presentation I attended yesterday. So we're here in uh, Queensland for five days, in Brisbane for four and in Townsville for one, meeting with a range of organisations. So the team is going to a range of meetings. Um, and I was at a presentation yesterday on my own where an organisation presented what I regard as an outstanding opportunity, um, one that we don't currently have the funding for, and I was fairly open uh, with the organisation in making that point, but one in which we may be able to find some funding for, and I've already sent an email off to my um, medical research uh, governors this morning about the presentation. And I also made the, um, the offer of uh, potentially opening uh, a door uh, from an introduction at least to another funder. Again, an email which I've sent off already this morning. Um, I've no doubt this organisation that presented to us yesterday will succeed. We may or may not be a partner initially in that project, but ultimately I'm confident over time we'll work with them. Uh, because I saw alignments uh, in our major grants area, in our medical research area, in our science area, in our health area as well. Um, and so that is just the, the initial conversation. It's the start of a journey. It may result in funding for this particular pitch. It may not. But ultimately, 
Uh, the message I tried to give them yesterday was that I thought it was an outstanding presentation and one uh, that will be the start of a conversation. Um, and they're exactly the type of conversations that all of the program managers do have. Um, I'm told I'm getting better at saying no uh, because, you know, 10% from EOI through to funded grant means 90% miss out. Um, I'm very enthusiastic. I, I give a good vibe in meetings, but ultimately we say no a lot of times. Um, and just, you know, be prepared to hear that um, and uh, be prepared to celebrate when you are successful. So, a couple of things to highlight. Do we have the, um, the running sheet that was here? Not a good thing to lose it. Okay, I might have it here. Um, I do. I was about to blame everyone else but myself. Okay. Um, we now have Q&A until 11.15, um, and the time here is 10.04. Uh, sorry, till 10.45, I apologise. So we've got about 40 minutes of Q&A on the running sheet. Alberto's going to run the q and I'm going to ask both Louise and Squirrel to come up on the casting couch and sit on the casting couch. Um, I'll remind Alberto, if you don't mind, just to keep an eye out for Mairead so we can take questions from the webinar. And for those people on the webinar and participating, you can actually ask questions via Mairead online. Nicole and I are then going to arm ourselves with microphones and we are going to be the roving people in the audience. If we're required to answer a question, throw to us as well. And I'll remind you again, if you do uh, want to ask a question, if you would please introduce yourself and your organisation, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Can I have one of those? Well, thank you. Um, given we are in a the theatre, I was wondering if we're going to give a round of applause to the program managers. So just before we start, just warming them up. And uh, thank you very much. That was shameless, sorry about that. Um, before we start, can I get a raise of hand for those of you that uh, had heard of the Ian Potter Foundation before coming today? All right, oh, that's great. No, 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 keep them up, keep them up. Um, those of you uh, that have applied to the Ian Potter Foundation, keep your hands up. And those of you that have received a grant from the Ian Potter Foundation, so that's about 10%. <laughs> All right, so um, very open mic, very open questions. Ask anything you would like to know. Um, I, have I never used Tinder in my life. I, um, so very, very open. Ask any questions. We'll, we'll give it to the right program managers. Okay, to, to I have answer. one here, Alberto. Yeah. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Hello, um, my name is Megan Elliott. I'm from Ginger Cloud Foundation. My question is around um, how we communicate a uh, kind of a transfers of a transference of framework. So we've developed a um, a framework uh, through the foundation that we support sporting clubs, primarily rugby at the moment, to deliver a modified rugby program for children and young adults with learning and perceptual disabilities. But through that pathway now, we've identified that that framework can be equally applied to um, work experience for our children as they're coming through. For instance, our son is 14, he has autism, and it's great, it's very difficult to gain work experience, and we know there's a direct alignment between work experience and then full-time employment. But we're finding it tricky to communicate how we apply that framework in a different environment that's not sport. I'm just wondering if you have any tips about how we could communicate that within the um, application process. Yeah, look, I'll, I'll answer that. I am um, program manager for health and disability and what we do in disability is precisely providing pathways onto employment for people with disabilities. Um, just show your success. Um, obviously, you've been running for a while. Has had some success in sport? There's more participation in sport from, uh, from your demographic that you work with, and you want to translate it into employment. You, uh, you have success, prior success. Uh, you said you want to uh, try a new framework. Obviously, it's based on research and, and uh, opportunities that you have seen in the landscape around you, so it doesn't come out of the blue. Uh, it's just a matter of, uh, of telling us how you're going to implement from one to the other and give you a previous evidence of success. Now, we're a philanthropic foundation, we take punts and we take risks, that's what we're here for. Uh, so the fact that it's never tried before is actually not a detriment at all. Another question? Is that over there? Craig, the other yeah. side of the world. Coming? Well, while he's getting over there, yeah. do you yep. want to? Oh yes, the webinar, oh, that's so exciting. <laughs> First time. 
Um, I've got Christy from the Bundanon Trust. She has asked a question. I just have to find it again. Uh, there was a lot of talk about longer term sustainability and outcomes, but also of projects. Would the foundation consider funding an organisation for a specific period tied to organisational strategic goals rather than a specific project? Yes, we, we have done that in the past. Um, Squirrel, do you want to elaborate or Louise? We have done that, certainly. Um, it's a matter really of you making the case for why it is that, that um, you need core funding, I presume that's what she's talking about, at this particular time. And it might be related to an expansion, it might be that you're in a period, a tipping point, a period of transition, it might be that you're scaling up. So it's not just can you please fund us for the next three years, but it has to have a very strategic, specific purpose. So it would be about making the case for why it is that you're requesting core support rather than project support. So it's a possibility, but you have to make a very strong case for it. And of course, it needs to align with our guidelines and priorities. If you're you know, operating in a sector we don't fund, it's probably unlikely to fund core business. Uh, Robert Pekin from the Food Connect Foundation. Just wanted to clear up a bit of the uh, conflicting information, Roberto, between you were saying you know, we want to look at um, big picture ideas and, uh, um, you know, things that are looking at systemic issues and then, but the, the grant areas seem to have a lot of um, areas that uh, were quite specific. We, we particularly work in food and agriculture, so we cover everything from health right through to climate change to poverty, to a whole bunch of things inside of those sectors. So, so how would we approach... Um, applying for some of the things that, you know, because, because food and agriculture is so big and so large and we, we want to address it at the systemic level, we find the issues or a lot of, we've never applied for a grant before, so um, from any organisation because of this very issue that it's, it's issues based, it's, it's silos based and uh, for us to write applications that, that, that uh, take a systemic view where we're putting forward um, we're putting forward solutions to a rather large problem. Um, have you got any advice that we might? Well, uh, look, I would break it down to manageable tasks. I mean, obviously, you want to solve poverty. Uh, you know, that's pretty big. Uh, you know, we, we, we are looking at systemic issues. I mean, we're looking at youth unemployment. That's massive. Uh, but, you know, you might have a, a particular take to do that. So you want to run a mentorship program or you want to run a program that uses schools or, or something else. So. Um, any systemic issues will still have some elements, programmatic operations, that we might uh, find interesting. So uh, it's not that we don't look at both, but obviously uh, at the end of the day you can apply f you know, to solve poverty or to solve uh, you know, biodiversity unless you tell us how you're going to do that. So it boils down to the project and the project that is well conceived and well uh, you know, evaluated at the end. Can I add a comment to that, Alberto? Sorry, I'm up here. Um, just, uh, we also have what we refer to now as a major grant stream. So we distribute about 24 to $25 million annually through the Potter Foundation, of which half is through the program areas and half is through the major grants. Now the reason for that is twofold. Initially it's because of what I inherited in terms of the existing commitments, where we had significant grants that just did not meet funding guidelines, but were being effectively allocated into areas inappropriately. And so I got board permission to split out major grants. And what we are now doing with the major grants is we are being completely proactive in identifying the areas that we'd like to support. Um, so for the coming 18 months or so, we'll focus on the issue of available and affordable housing from a homelessness perspective and look at projects that uh, are potentially demonstration projects that have applicability on a national scale and could be transferable. Um, so we're, we're looking bigger picture at that issue and also then looking at Indigenous opportunities. Um, and so that's about us as an organisation, and Alberto and myself in particular in those two areas, having conversations with groups about bigger picture systemic issues and understanding whether we can support them as part of their journey, and in your case your journey, on wanting to solve, the, on wanting to solve those bigger issues. So my advice to you would be to start a conversation. Give us a sense as to who you are, give us a sense as to what it is you want to achieve. Um, my view is that we could assist you in really 
narrowing your focus and articulating your story better so that you could start to pitch to either us or government or other stakeholders effectively to facilitate whatever funding you require to achieve the outcomes you want to achieve. Thank you. We and come sure. to the environment and conservation breakout session afterwards. Great. Um, we have a question from the webinar. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions relating to communication. Um, Jamie from Healthy Land and Water asks, for an organisation not known to the foundation, do you encourage presentations as a way to develop a relationship or does the foundation prefer contact to be made on specific grant applications only? Nicole, do you want to answer that? Uh, sure. Um, we prefer contact to be made on specific grant applications. There are only three program managers um, and we are inundated with calls and inquiries and um, requests for meetings so we can't unfortunately meet with everyone as much as we would love to and we obviously also try to travel quite a bit all over Australia so um, contact through grant applications is the preferred course of action. Hi Alberto, my name is Emma Thompson, I'm from Arthritis Queensland. Um, I just wanted to ask about your definition of prevention. We work with a lot of disease and conditions that at the moment we can't prevent and our approach is much more of a self-management um, way. So just in the health area with public health initiatives in the community, we've got some great plans and things we're doing, but they're not truly preventative unless you view prevention as reduction of impact. Yeah, well, th obviously that would be the case in, in your circumstance, uh, obviously. Uh that there would be programs and opportunities for people that suffer from the condition you mentioned that, that will uh, allow them to suffer a little less. So in that case, it certainly is a prevention. I mean, obviously, um, some things cannot be prevented, but can be better managed. So that's the case. Um, and, and when we talk about prevention, we're really meaning that we don't um, treat the symptoms that we're trying to get in early. It's early intervention um, more than in, in, um, prevention specifically. Just two quick questions. The first is, um, I understand the science round was suspended earlier this year, if there's any update on that. And the second is just clarification of um, the medical research round and what you do fund and don't fund. So I think my boss rang and spoke to you about um, some equipment purchases um, that you don't fund clinical trial work, but if the equipment was being purchased predominantly for preclinical work, but in the future sometime may be used for clinical trial work. Is that something that... Yeah, look, uh, um, this question is probably better answered in the other session, yep. but uh, uh, when we say we don't fund equipment for uh, clinical applications, that because the bottom line is that we don't fund equipment that should be purchased by hospitals or, or the health system. So obviously, it's, uh, equipment is used both cases of clinical applications and research, we'll consider that. Um, as far as the science ground is concerned? Uh, science will open um, again in 2018, so we'll open in March for a decision in September. The reason that we close the program this year is because there's no funding left, so we don't want to waste your time putting an application in that's going to go nowhere. I, I might just add a comment there, just so people understand. Again, um, the foundation uh, became a public ancillary fund in 2013, and so in the subsequent years, 14 and 15, uh, being a little bit crude, uh, the board went a bit nuts um, and just uh, granted a lot of approved a lot of applications. And so when I looked at uh, the pre-commitments in the program areas for both fiscal 17 and fiscal 18, we've basically pre-committed about 84% of our distribution capacity in each of those fiscal years. Um, and so we just have a bottleneck. Um, it unfortunately takes 12 to 18 months to clear. Um, because we're also looking at now larger grants and multi-year grants, the last thing I want to do is open an application round and continue to have that digestion, for want of a better term, for an extended period. So we've closed some rounds uh, and fiscal 19 will then have significant capacity in the other program area, all the program areas to open again. I think I have a question in the middle here and I'm going to shuffle across, excuse me. Thank you. Marae, do you keep an eye on that? Yes. Right. Hi, Sharon Hetherington from Bernie Bray Limited. Um, we've over the years received a number of grants through various um, government and non-government agencies to collect quite a large data set on intervention studies with older people. So now we have about five different um, data sets from uh, a range of residential, community, um, aged care and um, hospital settings and it's a common data set. 
would the Ian Potter Foundation um, be open to funding some way that we could uh, have the time to collate, analyse and disseminate those, the information from those uh, different data sets to the benefit of community health for older people? And that depends on how you apply it in the public health sector and space. Uh, so it depends what's the end game of the of the data. I mean, data is just data, but it depends what you're doing with it and uh, how you see value in it and what other partners you have on board as well. So, But on data, we're all probably the best person to ask for. Hi, Lachlan from Music Aviva. I'm interested in the question of sustainability. We do a lot of regional schools touring and that those programs are not sustainable without contributed uh, revenue. Um, is the foundation interested? How do, do we deal with that question of sustainability when it simply can't happen without that extra support? I'll take this one. I guess one of the things that we're looking for with arts organisations where we understand that often they cannot bring in enough income and receive enough government support to be sustainable. So they operate very much on the margins and we completely understand that. The key thing we look for is that you have strategies in place, that there are multiple avenues of funding. You've got a nice uh, diverse funding mix, that you've got good strategies in place. You're looking at um, things like harnessing your audience. You might be looking at crowdfunding. You might be looking at um, a mix of earned income and small donations from your own contacts. So it's not just have you got the funding in place, but it's what kind of broad strategies and um, methods have you got to ensure that you've got the, you're in the best possible place. And in terms of um, giving grants to support the work that you do, even though it, it can't cover its own costs, we do that. We, some, we, we do sometimes work in that space, though we may be moving away from the specific regional touring area, um, but it, it just, it's about a matter of how strategic and specific the projects are and whether they appeal to our governors. So we're less likely, if there's no other strategic growth in it, if it's just can you contribute to us running this program for another two years, less likely to be prioritised. However, if we can see that it's part of a really considered growth plan, that your board has an expansion plan or a way to tide you over while you implement a new CRM, um, customer relations system, um, then, then that might be considered. So it comes back to your strategy and how, how it aligns to your mission and what your long-term goals are rather than just can you keep us afloat for another two years. Yes, please. Hello, I'm Sue from Law Right. You've previously funded a, a program of ours, Legal Pod, so thank you. But uh, um, I'm sure, like others, our program operates in an environment where government funding, which we view as our the responsible, who has the responsibility for this access to justice area, they wax and wane in their commitment to the legal sector, community legal sector generally, uh, and to this particular client group. So I'm interested in um, <coughs> how you see that, um, and that for us, for this particular program, it means that we can never grow because we're kind of always on rations and, and, and the capacity to, to grow has eluded us um, despite, uh, despite our clear impact for, for, for the group. Well, um, we always consider government funding in, in every project. To, uh, it's under, uh, under assessment because obviously, you know, you will you all know that uh, it's not the role of philanthropy to you know, bankroll a program, any given program, for any indefinite amount of time. In fact, you know, the, the ultimate Shangri-La in philanthropy is starting something and then government picks it up. And we have a few occasions of those, those instances. Uh, it, it's hard. It's hard, there's no doubt it's hard, but it's a program that uh, is much needed. It was very successful, uh, coalesced a number of uh, pro bono lawyers around it, makes sense in terms of preventing homelessness. I remember it very well. Um, you know, it just, uh, it just, you get up, you know, stuck, up, stuck by it. Uh, um, 
expansion for its own sake, it's not always necessary. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there's a lot of talking about in these days of going deep instead of wide, you know, and this stuff. stuff. So uh, many organizations often, you know, build up the uh, expertise and the success and have a case to put forward to the next round of government. And sometimes it works like that. Sometimes we'll pick up programs like this at the beginning. Sometimes we pick them up halfway through. Uh, you know, we'll, we will never be there for the, you know, for the very long term. It's unlikely. Can I add a bit to that? I, I think it's an excellent question and something that we are trying to work with more as a, as a funding organization, you know, beyond just granting the money, how else can we assist with sustainability, dissemination, and leverage so that you can have more of that long-term assurance that your project is going to be okay? Um, Three pieces of advice, one, involving those key stakeholders early and not just the uh, ones in government now, but the opposition as well, and having a really clearly pitched message with which to do that. So you, you already have this, but you know, just the, that one page infographic, that, that elevator pitch down pat. And then the last I'd say is we are trying to be more open as a foundation, encouraging people to lean on us, contact us, ask us a bit more about using networks. And so we're here meeting with grantees right now, and we're meeting with uh, potential applicants, but we're also meeting with government officials, and director generals, ministers, the chief scientists, where we can, so that we are able to help continue and facilitate that conversation. We cannot promise anything, but it, it may just be getting into the right ear of the right person um, on both sides of government and that might help you survive the rise and fall. So that is definitely something I would encourage, especially if and when you get a Potter grant, work with your program manager on that. We're happy to do things like write letters, pick up the phone. We won't be an endless advocate for every little thing, but if you're talking about the core funding sustainability of your program and you've made a clear case for it, we're more than happy to assist with that. Yeah, more on this. I mean, I was in Hobart about six months ago uh, on, a, on a launch of a program we funded, uh, and I was sitting next to the governor of Tasmania. And let me tell you about another program we funded in Launceston, governor. So we, we will do that. We will do that because, again, you know, in order for us to succeed, uh, you need to succeed. Uh, so we will use uh, anything we can, we can provide uh, beyond grant to facilitate the expansion or the consolidation of a program. It might not work, but we'll give it the best shot. I've got a related question. Thank um, you from the webinar. Um, it's from Morgan from the Footscray Community Arts Centre. Um, he's just wondering, does the foundation play an advocacy role to government to support organisations to make that transition between philanthropic support to long-term government support? Well, that goes along with what we just touched on. I mean, uh, uh, it depends what you define as advocacy. You know, if, if uh, you know, having meetings and writing letter is advocacy, that would certainly do that, uh, and, that and that's what and that's why we see it. we see that as part of our role. The reason being that we backed a program that we believe was very good and it's been very successful. So why wouldn't we, you know, go the extra mile to to provide that program with some some more life? We have a question here, Alberto. Yep. Oh, wait, wait. Marco, Marco. <laughs> yeah, yep. Sorry, I'm, I'm <laughs> there. Right. Um, my name's Kieran Rickard. I'm from a social enterprise called Natura Pacific. And um, I guess my question relates to social enterprises because I understand that from the eligibility criteria for your organisation, it is open to not for profits. Um, as a social enterprise, um, our main aim is philanthropic philanthropic goals and we obviously have the same restrictions on every grant just about available to, to any NGO. Um, however, being a, a business, we are also treated by the ATO as a business. Um, does your organisation have on the radar any mechanisms to be able to support um, social enterprises in the future given that it's an incredible space that is growing very, very rapidly? Yeah. Um, and could probably address some of the issues that people are raising here and now as something more sustainable. Mm. Well, let me know. Let me tell you a bit about social enterprise in us. In the past five years, we funded about 17 projects to the tune of 4.5 million. So uh, we're certainly aware of social enterprises uh, while they go in the sector. And, uh, 
great work they do. Um, we can only fund organizations that have DGR and TCC status. So if you're not structured as that, unfortunately we cannot fund you. But we'll certainly consider social enterprises as part of any other grant that we consider. And we certainly like it. Uh, our board governors really understand it well. And, uh, you know, we certainly be likely, you know, be very happy to be involved in it. I might just add, Alberto, for context, um, in 2014, uh, the Foundation awarded 11 50th anniversary grants, so they were half a million dollar grants each, it was five and a half million dollars in total, and two of those 11 grants were actually two social enterprises. One, an organisation, uh, Social Traders, supporting uh, Connect, I think is the, uh, the project name, and the other was to Street, uh, which is a social enterprise based in Melbourne, so we are a strong funder, and Alberto probably understates his passion for supporting social enterprise as well. It is important, though, that you have that DGR and TCC tax status, though. That's critical. Yeah, no, you need that. Sorry, any other questions up here? Um, I've got one that's just come up on the Sorry, webinar again, Adriel. Um, I think it's related to major projects or major program stream. Their question's kind of relating to, I think they're representing a number of suicide prevention projects. So they're just kind of, a, I guess it's a question about the definition of that program area and combining shared visions, not just one project or one organisation. Is that big picture strategy fit? I think that's the... I might field that one. I think um, we would ideally love it if all projects came to us like that, big picture, sector-wide, collaborative, and that's within every program area. So it's not just one person coming for one suicide prevention project that's going to last one year, but you know that, that big picture thinking would Yes, cut into the major grants, but ideally it's cutting into every, and that is the type of thinking. Obviously, um, for example, you take medical research and think of research equipment. If it's just going to be used by one research group, it's going to score a bit lower you know, you know, as we're assessing it than if it's going to be used by multiple groups over multiple periods of time. It just makes sense, so we do look for that. The short answer is yes, but not just in major. Um, and just to add to that, we try to create the biggest ripple effect we can with the grants that we make, particularly with our major grants, and that's what we're looking for. I might add too, just to reiterate, that you cannot apply for a major grant. The team here actually sources, um, finds and, and sources and invites applications to our major grant round. They often, but not always, go to organisations where we have an existing relationship so it's a matter of us doing our research and finding out who's doing what on the ground. Perhaps we might get an email, very brief email from organisations explaining this is what we're doing, we're keen for you to know about it, not too much information, um, so that it gets on our radar and then we do our research. So they often take years, 12, 18 months, up to three years to actually develop the relationship and to get to the point where we then invite for a major grant. And, and I might add that's true also for the program areas and a good example is a grant in the environment conservation space that was awarded at our board meeting uh, December of last year uh, and that was a grant to ANU, it's a farm based biodiversity grant, it's a $14 million project which we funded to the tune of $2 million. Um, and Louise and I first met with the relevant scientists at ANU in November of 2015, after I just joined. Uh, he pitched uh, you know, an idea for two years of funding and we stopped him and said, look, we're more about impact and big picture. So gave him 30 seconds and said, pitch us your big idea, because uh, we liked what we were hearing. And so he was ready and he said, okay, I've got a five year vision for this, this is what I want to do. And from November 15 through until December 16 is how long it took for us to work up the plan with him. Myself and one of the members of the board spent two days in Albury with himself, with some LLS representatives, with Landcare representatives, we met with farmers, we did a lot of due diligence and ultimately the grant was approved. That was a 13 month process from an initial uh, five minute pitch uh, that morphed into a, a bigger pitch and we worked hand in glove with them. So that happens in the program area um, as well as it does uh, with the major grants. Um, and the message I'm giving to the team is that I want us to source an increased proportion of grants in what I describe as a proactive manner. And that's quite simple. A reactive manner to me is responding to an application we've received through our application process. A proactive grant is one that we've sourced, 
potentially from a phone call from you and a meeting, and then we go from there. But it's, it's, it's out of the, the normal round, if you like. At the last board meeting, uh, I got board approval to reduce the number of open rounds per program area to one a year. It used to be two a year. And the simple reason for that is because these guys are just absolutely inundated with volume whenever we have an EOR application process. And they don't have enough time to then physically find those great organisations to fund and those great opportunities to fund. And so given that I've halved the funding in the program areas by introducing the major grants, I thought it was appropriate to then reduce the number of open rounds from two to one, which we've done. Uh, so we will be a far more proactive uh, foundation. I hope if you read our website, you also understand that we are incredibly transparent. I'm very comfortable sharing with you the quantum of our funding, um, the areas that we fund in, and also I think it's important to understand that uh, the reference to the comment that you made before about those narrow areas, and the program areas. Um, the narrowed focus in our program areas is actually driven by the work that Squirrel has done in the last five years, where Squirrel has now entered 1,103 uh, grants into our database. Um, 1,103. Four, I got up early this morning. Yeah. Um, and that was actually what she was employed for uh, by my predecessor when she first joined. And we believe, Squirrel, we're the only foundation in the world, possibly, that has a five-year history of closed and acquitted grants in a database with outcome measurement. And we're then using that evidence base to then drive the narrowing of our guidelines in the program areas based on what we know works. So it's a real process that we go through, and I think it's important that you just understand that. Thanks, Alberto. Um, any other questions? questions? Hello. Um, my question is whether the Potter Foundation would consider funding an Australian-based organisation, small NGO, to do work in a developing country in South Pacific, as long as it met all the other criteria? No. We only Have fund in Australia for Australian purposes. Okay. Alberto Windy from the Australian Centre for Philanthropy and Nonprofit Studies at QUT. Uh, this is actually a comment rather than a question that I thought might be helpful for this group in that uh, when you are one of the nine out of ten not able to get a grant, there might be grants offshore for you and being Queenslanders you can come in and use for free the database of all of the foundation sector grants in the US uh, and there's also quarterly free training that's provided by volunteer grant seeking experts from strategic grants. So um, I would urge you to use that. I, I was just speaking with someone last night who's picked up a $50,000 grant after coming to that collection. It's called the Community Collection uh, by the Foundation Centre. So I think that if you are looking also for um, people who might want to join uh, and collaborate with Potter on funding, you can also access for free the Philanthropy Australia database there. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, everybody to SCPNS after this. <laughs> Another question over there? Hi, I'm Simona Shari from Creative Partnerships Australia. Hello, Wendy, you're speaking for me at an event soon. Um, I just wanted to uh, ask you, with our match funding program, with the unsuccessful applications, it's really clear when I read through them, the big red flags um, that I can see. And I just wanted to know, what are the most common big red flags that you do see um, across your unsuccessful applications? Well, Squirrels collected uh, the uh, grantees and applicants' lessons and will distribute some of them, so she might want to talk about some of the flags. Yes, and also I'll be talking about it more in the evaluation workshop, so not to spend too much time on it. I think Craig has a great saying, you know, fund the organization in, more so than the project. So the biggest red flags for us will come if we're doing our due diligence on you as an organization and we notice something amiss, say, in the budget. Um, that's not to say that if your budget, you know, your reserves are low or that we won't fund you at all, but you might want to explain to us, as Louise was saying earlier, what your strategic plan is, where you are, how you might be recovering from, say, you held a performance and it, it, it just hit your reserves and now you've got XYZ strategy in place. So really being um, able to explain those financials because I would say organization red flags often come from that. Another is if you're not working in tandem with others in the sector that we know are doing similar work. And so sometimes we'll just ring um, previous grantees of ours or other grantees of ours and say, oh, have you heard of so-and-so's work? How is, you know, 
and if they're able to say, yeah, yeah, they're doing great things, really support them, we're collaborating with them on this other project, that's, that's um, I'd almost call that the you know, a white flag or a green flag as opposed to a red flag. I've got some red flags that I can think of, especially for ones that don't, don't get through the EOI phase, where they're the sort of first knocked out. So one is where the whole application is saying, we are brilliant, we do the most fantastic work, we're the best, full of superlatives, but you actually have no idea what they will do with the money. So key red, red flag is we read the whole thing and have no idea what they want to do. Tell us how you will spend the money. We will employ a person, we will buy software, we will undertake training, we will hire trucks and drive to Uluru. Whatever it is, that's a key one. Be specific. And, and building onto that, I would also say if there's no mention of risk, or you just, because one of our questions is what are some risks to the project, and you just gloss over it like, no, no problems at all, nothing's wrong here. Um, that's a bit of a red flag and a worry too, instead of a carefully considered, well, some of the risks may involve, you know, sole reliance on a single personnel staff. Um, and again, I'll go through in the evaluation workshop some of the, we'll just call them key mistakes, but you know, grantee learnings that we can pass on to you on that vein. Thank you. Um, and just to reiterate about sustainability, um, if it's something that you're wanting to be picked up by government, you need to be talking to government before you start the project to see if there's any interest, whether it aligns, not just deliver the project and then hope for the best at the end. So we're really looking for that long-term thinking. I think um, if you go back to the presentation, and we might make it available after today, um, Louise went through all the funding principles. Every application that we receive is reviewed against those funding principles. So if you're collaborative, if you're thinking long term, if it's early intervention, if you've got leverage, if other funders are funding, then it's more likely to be successful. If you're not ticking any of those boxes, then, you know, it's massive red flags all over the application. So. Um, do you prefer a phone call before we go to the EOI process to say, look, this is our concept? It's essential. Uh, we actually uh, strongly recommend, that means you have to, uh, and we note down in the OI, um, there's a question in the OI that says which program manager have you spoken with before submitting. Um, sadly, about 20% of the OIs that received this round didn't speak with me at all and sent it in. Now, obviously, you know, in 90% of those cases, the project weren't a priority or match with the out guidelines at all. Um, people send that in. We can't stop you from sending your eyes, but you know we, we you know we don't want to waste your time essentially. So, so a phone call before your eyes is actually essential, uh, and uh, another phone call to let us know how you go and what you do on a short email, as Luis said, is also very welcome. Right. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Probably last question, Alberto, if there is one. No more questions, or you could save them up for the breakout sessions, which we'll move save to soon. Up. All right, you good? Uh, I think I did have one that I didn't get to before. Let me just check. Some thinking music for Mairead. Da, 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 Nicole's da, walking da, up the stairs. Oh, yes, I Lorna from Theatre Inc. She had a question about staying in touch. For a small organisation who has a grant, how much do you want to hear from the non grant activities, if at all? I mean, look, we, we, we like emails and, and uh, newsletters and the likes. I mean, I like them. You know, people, people call me on a semi regular basis. Uh, you know, every week, probably not, but you know, every three, four months, as you have new programs, as you achieve the outcomes, as you receive more funding, please let us know. It all helps us to, to grow our knowledge uh, to, work, to do our job better, which is your job as well. So. And I might, um, I might just add to that. Um, I produce a CEO report for the board papers. We have three board meetings a year. Um, and the main area, or the most voluminous part of the CEO report, is actually feedback on uh, current grantees' progress. Um, and that can be uh, closed and acquitted grants, it can be active grants, um, but the board is very keen uh, for us as uh, management and staff um, to keep them appraised as to how our projects are going, warts and all, uh, those that are going well and those that aren't. So it gets back to that early comment about um, two-way communication, open communication uh, between yourselves and ourselves. So I might wrap up if I can. Also, oh, do you have one more question? 
No? I can answer. I, it was just, um, I can ask it privately, but just going back to the social enterprise question around, um, we've got TCC, but we haven't got DGR. So if we've got a relationship with, for instance, um, TDI or social traders who have got DGR, we can actually approach you in a phone call around some of the... Unfortunately, we're not able to fund uh, under auspice. So the organization that is delivering the project must, must be the status. one that has the status yeah. uh -huh. uh, for it is, it is legislation that it will impact otherwise on our own status. So we cannot uh, devi deviate from that. So, so those um, social enterprises you spoke of before, they've all got DGR status? Yes. Yeah. Yes, oh, they do. So, okay. Well, look, can I thank you all for your attention and for your questions. We do have the individual sessions uh, that the program management team are going to run. I'd encourage you to attend those. Um, I think it's great, the turnout we've got here. Can I thank Josh and all the other team members for the quality of the venue. It's been outstanding as well, other than these lights. Um, and uh, I think we have half an hour for coffee out the front. Uh, we'll all be available to uh, have a chat and uh, talk to you then. Thank you very much.